There was a time when this spot wasn't safe for peaceful settlement. The French to the north and the British to the south used the river as a war path. Then in 1759, Rogers Rangers made their famous attack on the Canadian Indian village of St. Francis. And the French and Indian War began winding down. Two years later, Royal Governor Benning Wentworth granted a charter for the town of Hanover to 66 proprietors. Some of these settlers spent four summers exploring and surveying their town before the first family stayed here year round. The early settlers lived mostly by subsistence farming and trapping, and the life was hard. You have only to walk through the woods around here and look at the miles and miles of stone walls to see how hard it was. The soil was rocky and infertile, and the climate was harsh. Trade with the outside was mostly by flatboat up and down the river, or by ox cart over rough horse tracks toward the coast. Most town boundaries were laid out by map makers who'd never actually seen the country they were dividing. They just drew rectangles on big maps of the territory, and the royal governor granted them to settlers. Usually, the map makers put a star right in the middle of each rectangle and called that the town center. That's why so many towns around here have villages with names like Enfield Center, Grafton Center, Lyme Center, and Hanover Center. Beautiful, but very quiet. The towns grew up around the best land and resources, and the so-called centers of town pretty much dried up. Downtown Hanover, for example, is nine miles from here. After the revolution, transportation improved. For a while, it looked as though steamboats on the river were the answer. Locks were built along the river so that boats could travel from Connecticut all the way to Wells River. Captain Samuel Nutt set out in a small steamboat, a stern wheeler from Hartford, and he did indeed reach Wells River, where he was halted by a sandbar. Wolfboro Road was the first cross-state road, and soon eight horse teams on their way to Montreal were leaving nails, cloth, glass, rum, sugar, and molasses at the stores in the center. Turnpikes, taverns, stagecoaches, and post riders were parts of that colorful era. For Hanover, the Industrial Revolution was at least as important as the other one. The center of activity in town moved from the farms of Hanover Center downstream a couple of miles to Mill Village, where there were several dams and mills on Mink Brook. They moved the town clerk's office down here in the mid-1800s, and they held uh, town elections and town meetings here, too. The village is called Etna today, and the mills and dams and town offices are long gone. Daniel Webster, who was a student at Dartmouth in 1800, used to claim that he caught two-foot-long trout in this brook. Those days are gone, too, I'm afraid. When the railroad came to Lebanon and White River Junction around 1850, Hanover's isolation was truly over. A trip to Boston that used to take six days at the time of the Revolution now took only one day. Lewiston in Norwich became quite a busy station, handling both passengers and freight. One old timer I knew told me that in the wintertime, you could hear sleigh bells 24 hours a day as big freight sleds with dump bodies hauled coal from Lewiston across the river and up the hill to the college steam plant. After the Civil War, when the Western territories were open to settlement, Hanover lost a large number of its farmers who were sick of harvesting crops of glacial boulders. Woolen mills by then had sprung up along most of New England's major rivers, creating a demand for wool. So the abandoned farmlands were used for grazing sheep. Meanwhile, Dartmouth College continued to grow, and in 1893, Mary Hitchcock Hospital was dedicated. These two institutions became pretty much the business of Hanover as the farms and then sheep raising slowly faded. The poultry and the dairy farms that sold their produce locally by home delivery were the last to go. A few of the mills hung on a little longer, but by the turn of the century, the pattern for the next 100 years was pretty well established. Retail businesses and services, the college, and the hospital. Which brings us up to the time of living memory. 
Many people still living in Hanover recall very well the early and middle part of this century and the changes that have occurred here in these years. I want you to meet a few of them. Any recollections I have at first are of Hanover because I was, was born here. And um, at the time, my parents were living where the post office is now, right on the corner of Lebanon Street and Main Street, the south east corner there. And um, I was born on the day the First World War ended, on, on Armistice Day. We had a, it was a big old brick house with a barn and an orchard and a garden right there in the, smack in the middle of Main Street right now. And um, just the usual things of growing up. Um, we had an awning all around the south side of the house and the west side. And I think probably of some of my first recollections are swinging on that awning. If that's, and, um, then going, going to school, Hanover schools. Nobody ever uh, drove you anywhere or, or transported you anywhere it was, or got you into a bus or anything. It was uh, um, you went anywhere you wanted to go, you, you went on foot, although um, it wasn't that far in, the, in those days. But if, if we went skiing, um, I, I would put my skis on and and uh, on Main Street and just ski up the street to the golf course. There was no ice, I mean, there was no um, salt to melt the ice, so you could just ski up there and, and ski and then ski back down again when you were through. Um, well, f for one thing, I can remember every fall, my father draining all the fluids out of the car and putting it up on blocks and you, the, the car was put away for the winter. You didn't use it until spring came around. And uh, so that in itself is quite a, a change from the way it is now. Years ago, the first telephone office, it was a branch of the White River Junction telephone office, was in my father's store. This was the Dartmouth bookstore, which was where Bank East is now. It was on that corner for years and years. And they had the only telephone exchange in, in town for a long time. And, and my father's uh, younger brother used to go up and um, deliver messages. Of, it'd be a uh, telephone would come in, and then he would go down and, and uh, carry the message to somebody in town, let them know they had a phone call. We lived uh, when I was born on a house which is now on the side of Baker Library. That whole area where Baker Library now stands was, was in faculty housing at the time. And my small, my small friends lived in those houses on Elm Street. And there was a little community there. Uh, Dartmouth uh, was served by a number of private eating clubs at the time, uh, before uh, Fair, uh, Fair Hall, which is the college dining room, was built. And one of these, one of the better, one, best ones, was owned by the Hawes family. Amber Hawes was a classmate of mine. And uh, we used to, we found that if we went, up, showed up down there at recess down over the hill at the bottom, that we would often get a piece of pie, or some other, some other kind of. Uh, you know, very, Amber was very generous in passing out the family pies. We lived in 14 different houses when I was growing up. One of these uh, was uh, uh, at what later became known as the Villa Clara, a, f a, a farmhouse, a big, a good-sized farm, four miles out of town on the Nineheim Road. My father was very good at other things mechanical as an engineer. He had he, he knew knew nothing about farm animals or how to deal with them. And in the wintertime, the only way to really to get around was a horse and sleigh. And he couldn't do that very well. So he hired a man to plow a road on the Connecticut River. And we kept the family ford on the, ri on the river that winter and went back and forth to town on the river. On the river. Uh, we got it off in time in the spring before it went through. He couldn't get it off at the, at the, at the legend bridge, Ed. He used to leave it under the bridge. 
and, and, and walk up to the main street every day. And it worked very well, too, except that the paper mill was going in Wilder at the time, the international paper. And they closed it down, closed it, had the water power down over the weekend. That made the river back up over the ice, so that on Mondays when we went to town, we went through about two inches of water on top of the ice, and there were great clouds of spray going. I can remember sitting up in front. My, my brother was born that year, that winter. My mother was clutching the newborn babe, was in the back seat. And we went down, I thought this was great stuff. She didn't like it quite so well. A lot of the years that I was in school in that, or in, in high school, I lived right there on Lebanon Street, across from Rogers Garage, and this was before the old nugget burnt. And uh, Trumbull Nelson was right there on Lebanon Street. And like you say, there were residential houses both sides. Uh, this happened to be the house right next to the Grange Hall, and the Grange Hall is still there, so it's easier to identify it. But uh, you wouldn't know it's the same town that's there now. It, I used to take care of uh, furnaces at different college buildings in the morning. There was one had a stoker and one was hand fed. And I used to take care of uh, coal furnaces instead of having a paper route, like a lot of kids. And I, that's how I earned my money. Uh, what little I had. We well, didn't need much money then, because you had all these things you said what children do. Go out and jump on the ice when it's going down the brook, and float down on the ice cakes till it gets pretty near to the falls, and then see if you can jump off before you drown, and all those things that, that society has, you know, a fire department or a police department or somebody to keep people from doing today to protect them. That was, that was fun back then. We used to ski with barrel stays with gyro rubbers for, for harnesses. And after you got sick of skiing on nice slopes of places, we'd go and ski down the dump where all the rats and the cans and the stumps and old car bodies and that were. And, and then we'd get kind of carried away and take a barrel that we used to get the staves brick barrels and he, they were all over the dump there. Put one kid in the barrel and the rest of us would stand there and roll him down over the dump and see how far he could go before the barrel hit an old stump or a car or something and broke and the staves went all to pieces. And that was fun, you know. <laughs> we thought it was fun today to be so dangerous that be a law against it, but we sure made a lot of entertainment. You know, we, <laughs> you can't imagine today what children used to do. Dick Stone ran the barber shop, which was under the bank where the Savings Bank is now. Uh, the pool room was downstairs, and, and barber shop. Everybody went there. Of course, during uh, pre-war, there were a lot of people with a lot of time. They weren't many employed in the winter. Uh, everybody went, played pool, and and I don't know if they gambled there. I wouldn't think so, because it wasn't legal, but uh, you hear a lot of stories. And of course, the barber shops were all the the local polit politics hung out, because uh, that's where you got all your information from. In 1925, when I started teaching here at Dartmouth, we had a group of young faculty couples who met almost every skiable day about two o'clock in front of Parker Apartments on North Park Street. We met there and uh, went down our skis through, through the College Park, then took Lime Road down the hill till we came to Girl Brook, turned left, followed the trail to Girl Brook to the old ski jump in the Vale of Tempe, so-called. Then we kept on going over toward the river and skied through the Cathedral of Pines, back up the hill to the Outing Club house where we had a snack to eat and coffee. Then we'd go to each other's homes. As like as not, someone would have a casserole, or at least we'd end up playing a little bridge. It was relaxed. There were three churches in, in Hanover when I came here, the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church and the so-called White Church. Not white because of its color, but named after Sanford White, the famous architect who was instrumental in redecorating it in the early days. After the service, the faculty would go across to the inn, pick up the Sacred Times or the Tarot Tribune, go in and have our dinner, one dollar each. There were several individuals who might be called characters. They were wonderful people. Start with Julius Mason, 
who was a mailman, had independent means so he could travel to France at the American Legion Convention for on his own, for example. But he was the person uh, who, in addition to delivering the mail, started the uh, very delightful habit of decorating our streets with flowers. He started near his own home on South Street, South Main Street, uh, a small display, and that has now grown since we have a major display of flowers planted uh, by a group of people in a garden club headed by Nan King. Although when we did have to shovel the snow off the streets back in the late 40s and early 50s, John Dickey would come down on the weekends and help us. We didn't have a snow loader in those days. We had to get out there and the merchants got out there and with shovels and we loaded the snow in the trucks and away they went. That's how we cleared Main Street off. Yeah. But then we'd we finally have, got enough money ahead and we bought, bought a snow loader. We'd have coffee and donuts ready for the yeah. guys yeah. to take a break. That was fun though, Peter, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Boy, just... Everybody turned out too. And it everybody. was all hand, hand work, it was shoveling, no plows. <laughs> when Peter spoke about Joe McDonald, uh, he had a very good friend in Al Foley. Al Foley was everybody's friend anyway, but Al used to eat in there every day. And one day, Al decided that uh, he ought to have his picture up on the wall. So he asked us if he could bring in a picture to put up on the wall. Well, that thing kind of mushroomed, and uh, pretty soon these women were coming in and asking if they get their husband's picture up there. And so Peter and I set regulations that they'd have to be in there eating in there regularly for 10 years. And that's how it started that thing. Of course, you know, in later years, it's got a lot of publicity when they decided to take the pictures down. It was in the Wall Street Journal. and. New York Times and other peri periodicals about it. Uh, they're running a contest to see whether they wanted the pictures to remain or not. But uh, that vote came out in favor of leaving the pictures up. Well, one of our regulars, daily regulars, was Ed Latham, who was later became librarian of the college. And Ed Latham used to bring Frost in in the afternoon for tea. Occasionally, Frost would like to have an ice cream soda. And uh, I, I remember one afternoon, it was a warm, sunny day, and they, he had had his ice cream soda. And he and Ed came up to pay the check. And old Frost looks at me and he says, you know, he says, there's more Dartmouth business transacted in here at Lou's than there is up at Parkhurst Hall. And uh, he, he was a fabulous guy. And when, when Ed and, and Dr. Betty French were married, uh, Robert Frost was their best man. And the other guy that I remember quite distinctly was Melvin Douglas. He, he, they, they lived up at Fairley. And whenever he was in Hanover, he, whenever he came into Lewes, one of the things he always particularly enjoyed at Lewes was American chop suey. He always used to have that if it was on the menu. That was one of the first rituals we went through, getting out there and sweeping the sidewalks. And that was when John Piani of the co-op and Campion used to have their biggest arguments. It would be the first thing in the morning. Ed Campion would be out there sweeping his front, Piani would be out there sweeping his front, and if Campion had a sale sign up in his window, Piani would start screaming at him, because he, he got ahead of him. People ask me every once in a while, I, uh, they'll, they'll stop me in the lobby and they'll say, well, do you miss do you miss being downtown being in business i says well really no i don't miss the business but i says i miss the people and that's one of the reasons that i get so involved with uh, with the different areas of work that i do i do four different jobs at the at the hospital and in all of them i'm involved with people you know either escorting patients or helping patients carrying out the newborn babies that's a real fringe benefit <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's this contact with people that we enjoyed for so many years. We build up friendships there that it's, it's invaluable. Pa used to roast peanuts in one of these machines with old charcoal. And I used to crank them up, even to the president of Dartmouth College, 
my, uh, Hopkins used to crank the Phoenix because he and a fellow by the name of uh, Professor Skinner, Professor Wicker, and Bill Murray, and, uh, and Hoppy or Hopkins used to stop and get the fresh penis before they went down to the ball game. And that, that to me is back, must be around 18, 1908 or 1910 or 1912, in that period of time. But we used to get business as far as Laconia. Why? We were probably the first store in this area to have things like articles, artichokes, Jerusalem artichokes, avocados. I love those doggone things. I still eat them. But things like specialty like that. We used to get strawberries that would be shipped in the morning. We'd go down. I'd go down with a buckboard and a horse down across the old covered bridge when it was there over and get the fruit. That brings up a story. I doubt if there's anybody around here living today that has a, has a ride on that river in a steamboat. Now, the guy that owned the steamboat's name was Dave Huggett. I'll never forget it. And at, at noontime, we used to wait at 12 o'clock to hear that whistle blow down in the, on the Connecticut River. His landing, or his tie-up, was right opposite, you know where the canoe club is. The, on the left-hand side, as you go on the other side around this place, there's a group of houses right in there. Well, right in that area used to be a dance hall. And right there was his landing. And that's where Dave Huggett had his steamboat. So he used to pay, t uh, the kids used to pay 10 or 15 cents and grown ups a quarter. Our store was noted for his penny candy. And the kids that were going to grade school and everything used to come in there. We had two telephones in there. And after school, those two telephones were ringing like were busy as the devil because they'd call up their parents, you know, after school, and they didn't have to ask anybody. They could automatically come in, use the telephones if they weren't busy. That's why we were so popular with the kids. In 1910, my father applied for the moving picture license in the town of Hanover. And the, the commissioner, the, the selectman was F.W. Davison, who owns the Davison Block, who put in the movies afterwards. A.W. Geyer, F.W. Davison, and Don S. Bridgman were the selectmen at the time. One was from Matna. They always used to have a selectman from Matna, see. So what happened was we were going to build a, a, a moving picture house right in there that would seat 250 people. On each side of that runway was going to be a store. And I'm tickled to death they didn't build it because it would have been a very bad looking building to have on Main Street. You know what I mean? So, but in fairness to Mr. Davison, he came down to my father and offered to, to uh, uh, let him rent the theater at $1,800 a year with a 10-year lease. And the first year, Davison came down and showed my father how much money they made that year, and it was $10,000. In those days, it was a hell of a lot of money. I begged my father to take it because there was seven or eight kids in our family then, and God knows every damn one of us would be going to the movies, right? So... <laughs> the year before I arrived, the Nugget Theater had been built by Davison, who owned the big department store, and he built it to give a job to his son, Frank Davison, who did a very good job, and that was in the days when movies never had long runs. You had a different picture every night for six nights. Why not seven? Sunday was still honored in very, very strong blue laws in New Hampshire in those days, and nothing was supposed to happen at, uh, on Sundays. 
as some faculty wife expressed it one time, there were the tradesmen down here on Main Street, of which my father was one of those. And he came to uh, Halver in 1897. Uh, his uh, father had died and his mother remarried and he was brought up by his grandparents. And uh, he came, came down here and started a Dartmouth co-op on the site of Webster Hall, and which, was a, which was a building at that time, a wooden building and eventually moved to, uh, the store down here to Main Street and sold out to a group of us, which included Campion in 1929, and we lasted until 1931. And that was, those were tough mm -hmm. times. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a very good town-gown relationship. It was, excellent. Much better than what you hear in most colleges. The fire department was mostly manned by seniors of the college and there you had one or two, like Hawes, who maintained the equipment. But uh, the, you'd run out of class if you heard that fire bell go, no matter where you were. This was just one block of Main Street. It didn't go, and there wasn't anything beyond Lebanon Street, as I recall, uh, on Main Street. And uh, you would turn right at Allen, at Allen Street, and there was a, a little restaurant in there, but these were lunch counters rather than restaurants. Well, you spoke about ice cream sodas. I, I remember down at, at uh, well, it was Deacon Downing's at first, and then it was Putnam's Drugstore, which was the first drugstore or oldest drugstore in the United States, and which is now out of, out of existence. But they had something they called a fudge wet, which uh, included, uh, vanilla ice cream or chocolate if you preferred it, chocolate fudge sauce, and then they soaked walnuts in maple syrup and that was added to it and that was called a fudge wet. And it was, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, and sometimes I'd get out of school or a high school or so or, or college and about three o'clock and I was hungry and I'd have one of those to take me through it until about 6.30. The thing that I remember best about Hanover in those days was that there weren't uh, many other things to do. We had really to find our own entertainment with, it, with each other. It taught us the most important lesson in life, and that is how to get along with your fellow human beings. And we were really one big family without much intrusions elsewhere, and we uh, that's what was really the heart of the Dartmouth spirit, because we knew how to get along with each other. Well, I'll add one thing to, the, to that, Art. I think it taught us creativity. We, crea yeah, we yeah, created the things that we wanted to do, and we didn't get, in, get into problems and, and, and trouble mm -hmm. creating. Mm -hmm. You had a a more intimate relationship, and particularly with the students. Uh, there were not the sorts of scholarships that were that are available today to students. Uh, they weren't available in those days. It was very common for students to hold jobs within the community. Uh, and my grandfather was a, a very casual about financial affairs. Uh, he had a certain amount of money in the cash register at the start of the day, and at the end of the day, he had a little more, and that was his profit. And one didn't uh, pay much attention to probably the taxes in those in that era, uh, and he was very uh, quick to loan students money. Uh, over my lifetime, I've oftentimes run into older alumni who who say that they either worked for or borrowed money from my grandfather back in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, so I think that that was uh, probably the major difference in the style of doing business, much more intimate. Uh, manner. Tansy's was also the, the, the sole source of beer for Dartmouth students, uh, which was not a bad concession. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and there was one period of time, particularly in, uh, during the early part of the Second World War, when Dartmouth students were getting drafted off the campus and they'd go down to Tansy's and buy a case of beer and, and give, uh, give Tansy's a check which they knew was drawn on insufficient funds, but uh, they had bigger things ahead of them and they figured they wouldn't be around. So uh, Harry always saved those checks and in, in recent years when some of the classes from the 40s would come back to reunion, 
time. Harry loved to go around in the tents and say, is John Williams uh, back for a reunion? And he, if John Williams acknowledged his presence, he would be presented with a slightly overdue bad check. <laughs> Where I lived was on the other end of Ockham Pond, which was a wonderful skating facility in those days. Uh, we had what they called hockey boxes, which were essentially regulation-sized hockey rinks uh, with uh, five-foot boards around them. And we had four of them. And we had lights on two of them. In addition, we had a speed skating area reserved, and then a large area reserved for figure skating, and then another area for general skating. And all of this was maintained by a, a crew of men and uh, horses with planes that would, would shave the ice down, and uh, everything was plowed off as soon as it snowed. So it was a wonderful skating facility, right? Uh, well, I can remember not being unable to untie the knots on my skates and, and walking home with my skates on. It was that close. Uh, so that was a very important aspect of Hanover to me. I always spent my, my time up on the rink, uh, just came home for dinner. <laughs> when I think of the town, and when I think, and I think of, of Main Street, I always, um, I always think of Lou. Um, and I don't know if you'd call Lou a character. I suppose he is sort of a character, but he too is uh, symbolic of um, of the smallness of Hanover and what's nice about the smallness of Hanover. And I just have so many memories of going into to Lou's restaurant and uh, getting a chocolate ice cream soda after school. And Lou was always there. And I was really glad when Dartmouth went co-ed. Um, growing up. I, I have I have a, I have one memory. I have a one really vivid memory. When we were living on Clement Road, the same house that Ron and my father grew up in, we lived there for a year. And like Ron said, it was uh, it was too close to get a ride, but it was far enough away so that it was quite a walk. And I was in third grade, and I remember having to to walk home from school and having to walk by the fraternity houses and having to walk across the campus. And I was a little girl. And they used to whistle at me. These guys were desperate. You know, they were really, and it, it was just, it was just not natural. And uh, although I, I remember, um, I remember a lot of sport around it too. It was during Green Key weekend, the dates would all come, and there would just be masses of blankets all around Ockham Pond. And as as obnoxious, you know, third, fourth, fifth graders, we would just go, you know, lifting up all the blankets. I rode horseback. I rode horseback to school down here in Aetna, send the horse back home. My look put it in the back. There's been a lot of changes. When I'm gone, this will all be houses in here. Oh, yeah, my father, he, he done more plowing than I did. Oh, all over home there, he had the nice pair of Morgan horses. And I wor was working over to college here and just started in, I guess, probably in 35. And uh, golly, I come home, and he was plowing me, and he always had a big garden and uh, raised some corn and, and uh, beans. He liked beans. And uh, we had them every Saturday night. And then uh, during the, well, Depression, you know, my golly, it was hard going. So they took in, uh, we had, we eat good, honest. We ate very good, but I had, uh, like, dried beef, milk, gravy. We'd have it three times a day, I was going to say. No, it wasn't that bad. In the morning, we'd have oatmeal and, and cereal, milk, toast, a lot of toast. My brother and I ate a lot of toast. <laughs> my sister-in-law, she was up there, and my brother's, that's my brother's wife. And uh, you make me do some thinking here now. <laughs> Hill. There was a, there's hardly any houses. Keep this fire moving. No, no. We had a little everything: hens, sheep, turkeys, 
when we were living over over there, we used to raise turkeys there. We almost did enough out of the turkeys to pay taxes. For four old hen turkeys, we get about uh, about 60, 60 turkeys. We had a driving horse, take a sleigh, you go in, into town, make Hanover a pretty quick order, go down through there, about 15, 20 minutes. He would uh, really run. Well, there was all farmers around here when I was growing up. Farmers are lower in existence right now. I don't think it's more than 21, 21 to 22 head of cattle in all the town of Hanover. The dollar come a lot easier somewhere else. <laughs> This up in 1939 when we were sugaring. It, uh, we got the we got the old boards and stuff. We probably jumped off some boards there come for Cumble, and we paid them five dollars a load for the boards for burn up the sugar house. And, and this tin come over that and the, and the, the trees, the little bush trees we made it out of come out of the woods. We made it cheap because we didn't have no money at that time. <laughs> time uh, on a farmer is nothing. Mm -hmm. You just get to get up in the morning and when you get tired, you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a good day. We usually think of history as the study of the rise and fall of great civilizations. And of course, it is that. But history is also comprised of the details of the everyday lives of the people who've lived before us. These are often lost in the grand fabric of history. But when we can find and preserve them, they can tell us what life was like in those days now past and all but forgotten. I hope that these descriptions and recollections have helped to capture the flavor of what life was like in those early times in this small town on the banks of the Connecticut River, Hanover, New Hampshire.